Hi, I'm Jane Ellen, and this is Photography Talk with Alex Schultz and one of my favorite glass holes, Trey Ratcliffe. How are you, Trey? Yeah, that was a, a bad start. <laughs> <laughs> What? No, it's well, okay. isn't that what everyone with glasses is called? I'll, I'll be quiet during the intro. Keep going. <laughs> no, because I love it. Okay. Listeners. You, you can introduce me. <laughs> I think it's wonderful because uh, I want to hear what it's like, um, not just as photographers, for anyone to incorporate wearing glass in their life because I think it's, I love tech. I think it's super cool. But in case you didn't know, Trey tends to travel around the world just teeny bit. And I have been a fan of his photos, well, since as long as I've been on Google Plus. So that's uh, you know two years, like the rest of the world. They're extraordinary, and you probably already knew that. Trey lives in New Zealand, and that's why he's cold and has a fire down below or behind him, wherever. And yeah. I'm glad you had time to spend with us. Indeed. Yeah, well, thanks, uh, thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. <laughs> Listeners, you're in store for a great show here today. Most of you already know Trey because he has 11 million plus social media followers. Uh, and those that aren't familiar with Trey, you know, if you're familiar with HDR, he's one of the most recognized names in HDR. He's a photographer, artist, writer, adventurer, uh, been featured with ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, BBC. And his photos have well over 100 million views. Matter of fact, what's really cool is the first HDR photograph to hang in the Smithsonian is one of Trey's. So, Trey, really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule today. Uh, welcome. Well, thanks. Thank you, Alex. It's uh, it's good to be here. Me. Now, Trey, before now, we get I, to... Before Alex... Go ahead, oh, Jane. Yes. There's a delay on my end. But... What's it like? How do your kids respond? Do they want to wear glass? What's it like to to have it and experience uh, your tech and your photography? Because by the way, it looks really cool. <laughs> well, it's um, it is wonderful in many ways. So it's it's really changed my behavior and my photo taking and uh, a lot of things just around my personal life too. So you know, there's a thing about or Google Plus uh, that actually most people don't know is that most of the sharing on Google Plus is private. It's not public. It's among friends and family, this sort of thing. And I've been taking so many family photos just of my kids and and uh, you know we go on little trips or whatever and I'm making little videos all the time and I can send the video straight to YouTube and share it privately with the family or I take the photos and share them instantly with the family. So, you know, the whole, you know, the extended family, uh, you know, grandparents and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters, uh, we just love seeing photos of each other, you know. And so this makes it so easy to get photos. And now I realize that even though I'm a photographer or whatever, and I always have my cell phone or this, these situations, I'm actually very lazy. I'm like, oh, I can't be bothered to take my cell phone out <laughs> to take a cute picture of my daughter doing this wonderful thing. Uh, but now it's just there, you know, I just wink into it or I, I tap a little button or I talk to it and it, I'm grabbing these moments that I have normally just been missing and it is, it's a really nice technology that just gets up out of the way and uh, it's, been, uh, it's been wonderful for photo taking and then on the other side of the thing it's been really handy for, uh, you know, I get all my emails, um, I can look things up, I can Google anything anytime. This is a new ability that I'm not used to that I don't actually have to know anything which is good because I don't know much I can just ask I can just ask Google and it knows for me very good no oh, that's we... gonna change test taking won't it um, yeah it, it probably will because you can ask it math questions you can ask it like what does the flag of yeah. Sri Lanka look like or you know whatever so <laughs> it will change test taking they probably won't let you wear it in school unless actually I actually I, I love all these topics that are not photography related even though I'm sure you're audience wants to listen to it. But actually there's this one thing that I've realized. I let my son wear it to school sometimes here in, in, in Queenstown. And you know, if if you like let's say you have a, a day where you're you're a kid learning school, you have a hundred percent pie. Well, maybe you know twenty or thirty percent of that pie is spent like memorizing things. Um, which is kind of nonsensical in a way if you can just look it up. I remember they went to Einstein, some guy went, Oh Einstein, if you're so smart, what's the atomic number of lead? And Einstein says, well, why would I ever memorize what I can just easily look up? 
And so, if, you know, if kids maybe focus on how to learn or the joy of learning or, uh, you know, cultural things or artistic things or be, you can actually look up what you need to look up after you learn the hard skills of how to get through the world. That's excellent. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm, it's exciting new technology. Yeah. Now, Trey, before we get diving into some of the, the questions here, I understand you have a special offer for the listeners of this uh, this interview. Well, I know, yeah, sure, we could do this because I know you're, uh, uh, you're audit, you guys are in the social media and all this stuff, and maybe we could do a little uh, contest. We have, uh, we can do a giveaway. So we have a lot of things that, uh, you know, 99% of the stuff on my website, Stuck in Customs, is free, uh, mm -hmm. but maybe 1% of it we charge for. And so we made this really beautiful four-hour landscape tutorial where it's about two hours of watching me and a couple other people walk around New Zealand and set up for landscape photos and all kinds of situations. And then the other two hours of the video is really where the other magical part happens, which is the post-processing and all my tricks and what I like to do. And I think post-processing is really the most exciting thing about photography nowadays. So um, anyway, we sell this for like 100 bucks or 99 bucks on the website. So we can, I'm happy to give one away to uh, uh, some fine member of your audience. Fantastic. So now what do they have to do, Trey? Well, I don't know. I guess it's up to you. If you want to have a, you want to have people uh, leave a comment uh, someplace sure. and then you can just pick a random uh, winner. Works for me. So Photography talkers, you want this fantastic offer from Trey. Make a comment on our Facebook page. Uh, comment, we love Trey, we love something to do, is stuck in customs, whatever it is, post it on there. And at the end of the show, we'll pick somebody. All right, cool. That so, sounds fine. And uh, when, when do you want to give it away? At the end of the show, or do you want to let last uh, a week? Yeah, or we'll, let it, yeah we'll let it cook for, uh, we'll pick a winner tomorrow. Tomorrow. All right, very good. So Trey, moving into this here, what you have a really inspiring story. What how did you get into photography? What inspired you to become a photographer to start with? Well, um, this is always um, an interesting thing to think about, you know, what defines these forks in your life that lead you down one uh, dramatic path or another. And I don't know if there was like some special moment where it all Licked, so to speak, and I went down this particular fork. But I think it's like, you know, falling in love, in that it just sort of softly comes over you like a shadow, and you're under it before you even realize it. And so I would play with photography and have fun like a child, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I spent, you know, the early part of my uh, photography just wrestling with my own incompetence, uh, which I think so much about getting started with photography is about. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I was wrestling with my own incompetence in the solitude of nature rather than in front of other people. I feel sorry for people that have to learn photography while they're taking photos of other people because there's an added uh, you know, social <laughs> dynamic there. Um, so anyway, uh, I would just, I kind of got through this process of going out into nature and uh, you know, feeling the zen vibrations and everything. I, I don't want to get too new agey, but, but I did feel something there. It was, it was uh, nice. And then I would take these photos, I would kind of capture the life, then I would go back home and put everything on my computer. And then I really started to enjoy the post-processing, and I was amazed by the things you could do and the tools that were available. And this is, you know, this is whatever, five, six, seven years ago. And back then, nowadays post-processing is quite common, you know, sort of much more accepted. But back then it was, uh, you know, really it was uh, not, uh, not, done that often or is really frowned upon by the traditional photography community which was still making the transition to, to digital and I jumped straight into digital so I didn't have any of these uh, hang-ups uh, that uh, a lot of people are either have finally overcome or still having trouble overcoming so I I unapologetically uh, post process and I think it's because I just fell in love with it so early and I the pictures just felt pretty and nice and magical and it it just gave me so much good mojo. It just kept rolling, and it was sort of this snowball. It was sort of this self-fulfilling um, eventuality in my life that photography just suffused itself into my whole being. Wow, great! The uh, what a great answer, and being a pioneer in the, the HDR uh, world, Trey, you have some absolutely amazing work. Can you tell us about your first sale? 
Ah, uh, well, that's a good question. I'm trying to think about my first sale because my my situation is a little different than other uh, photographers in that I don't have uh, clients. Of course, there's nothing wrong with having clients, whether they're whether you're shooting wedding photos or taking photos of kids and portraits or you do client work for advertising agencies or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I, I happen not to do any of that sort of thing. And I kind of set up from the beginning not to have mm -hmm. clients. So I didn't really have a business model going into it. Um, I would just did everything you know, primarily for the art and for the love of it. And that still always comes first is the art and the love of it. And then sure. later me and the team, we have a nice team that we've grown over the years and so on and so forth that helps me out. So uh, now we put on our business hats from time to time and then we figure out, okay, how can we actually use this stuff to, to make money? Uh, so the first sale, it was just me um, and my wife uh, back in the day. And I put stuff always uh, full res um, on the website, on the blog, and I put it everywhere. And back then, it was just my website and Flickr. Those were pretty much the only two games in town. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I was never scared of people stealing it, and that's a whole other topic we may or may not want to go down. But um, I would put up full res photos, and then someone contacted me. I think it was someone from uh, like a Lufthansa in-flight magazine or something. And they said, oh, we really like this photo of so-and-so location, can we buy it from you and put it in our magazine? So I was shocked. I was like, oh, if you want to buy my photo, I'm honored. Um, and I'm not, I was like, I'm not a real photographer. I'm just playing. Um, and so I thought, oh, well, you know, if, if they, you know, if we're just sitting here kind of reactively waiting for stuff to come in, maybe there's something here. So then it started happening more and more and more as the website got more and more popular, got more and more views. Um, so... So yeah, it was it was very unexpected, and I'm I'm still always surprised when people actually buy the stuff because I don't <laughs> I don't think about it in those terms. Now, Trey, if you don't mind, can you give us an example in your your journey in photography of a point where you you failed at something, and can you share with the listener, listeners how did you overcome from that? Yeah, let me think about some time that I I uh, I mean, there's so many times that I failed and uh, I mean my gosh just um, mention those let's make the whole show <laughs> all your failures yeah um, gosh let me think about something uh, well as I'm gonna tell you something about failure in general then maybe as I'm telling you this I'll think of a specific example or specific story um, but I do find that I'm certainly not afraid of it and um, mm -hmm. I guess, um, I don't know when that happened, at some point, but it was quite a, uh, a reckoning moment once you realize you don't really have to be worried about failing and stuff because your real friends and your family, they don't, they don't judge you by your failures. You know, it, mm -hmm. you know this is a, it's, a, it's a long life and people are multifaceted creatures with various interests and things that they try to do. And I think that the more you, you try, um, the more interesting stuff comes out, the more interesting creations come out, and then you're, you know, in the end, you're not really judged by these little failures you make, but you know how hard you, you try and keep coming back and uh, uh, try to do something, you know, interesting, uh, creatively. So that's kind of the ultimate place that I've I've ended up. So a particular failure that I might have made with photography, oh my gosh. Um, well, I don't know. There's there's silly little hardware examples where I haven't had the settings right or I've accidentally erased cards. So like I'm on this magical uh, situation. I take photos and I, I lose the whole card because it's just a sheer incompetence or I wasn't concentrating. Um, man, I don't know. Let me, maybe I'll, my subconscious will keep processing that question and maybe I'll come up with a really well, good example of it. Yeah, we'll, we'll swing back over to that. Let's look on the other side of the fence. Have you had a I've made it moment? And if so, tell us about it. Have I had a what? I've made it moment. Oh. Well, I don't know. I um, Life, you know, kind of seems like this ongoing river that changes and evolves. And you, I don't really have this moment. Uh, I don't think like, oh my gosh, I've arrived or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. because um, 
I really do not. It's weird. Okay, there's two things going on. One, um, I take my photography and myself very, very seriously. Like, oh, this is serious art. This defines me, and you know, I almost like this emo art student in the corner. Um, you know, but then the other side of me is like, I don't take myself seriously at all, and I can't believe any of this stuff is happening. But both of these are like sort of this yin and yang that keep everything in balance. So sure. I'm never like, oh my gosh, I'm the man or whatever, because I'm I'm just a regular guy, and and I think actually, frankly, what keeps everything in check is I try so many different things, and I'm constantly experimenting which means the failures are just constantly there, you know, and the mistakes are constantly there. So it's like, you know, when you, um, I'm not really much of a golfer, but it is a lot like golf in a way because, you know, you can like have a few good holes and you're just, you're nailing it. And then you just, your game just goes to shit. You're like, what, what happens? You know, there's sort of this randomness in life because you just keep trying stuff. And that's the thing about golf is you're just, you're constantly set up to take another shot. You never like really stop um, until you're done with the course, but then you go back to the course. So the thing about golf is you're constantly being set up to have more successes or more mistakes. And that's how I kind of set up my photography life and my creative life, so that I'm constantly forcing myself to try new things and take more shots. And so that keeps everything in check when there's, you know, these unexpected failures that pop up. Mm -hmm. And keep out there, keep keep going at it. Yeah. So now, Trey, you're married, you have two little girls, you have a little boy. Can you share with folks, how do you balance such a, you know, a demanding photography career and your, your family? Well, uh, this, is, uh, this is always difficult to balance, but I do my best. Um, when I, like, so, for example, right now, I'm out of my little fortress of solitude. Okay, this is, we have a little <laughs> uh, two-bedroom um, cottage here. Uh, and then the, the main house is about a little uh, like a one minute walk away over there. And so that's mm -hmm. where the family is, my wife and the kids and everything. So I thought, oh, this is going to be good. I just recently moved out here like about a year ago or so uh, to New Zealand. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have my little fortress of solitude where I'll go out and I'll be able to focus and work and, and create. Because you know what it's like. Sometimes it takes five minutes to get into the flow, 30 minutes, you listen to music or whatever your process is for getting into a flow to actually create something interesting and bring it into the world. Um, and I really don't want to be interrupted during that because then I have to reset everything or I may never get back to the place I was. Creative processes are a weird thing um, that I don't really totally understand, but I just know when I'm getting into that flow. So um, what happens all the time is my kids come running over here. You know, they, they run in and they knock on the door. And, and, of course, when they come in, I'm very nice to them because then I'll yell at them and tell them to go away. That seems a little rough. Uh, so I welcome in. They want to sit on my knee and watch a YouTube video or, or whatever. And so I'm super nice to them all the time because I, I think I'm a pretty good dad or whatever and fun and, and this sort of thing. So what happens accidentally is there's this reverse Pavlovian thing going on where the kids are actually encouraged to come over here because I'm so nice to them every time. It snowballs. Um, so my fortress of solitude has just turned into Party Central um, by accident. Um, but, you know, we, we try to take as many family trips as we can together. Uh, the problem, um, you know, as you may probably know, Jane, is that you're, uh, when you have young kids, it's really hard to travel with young kids, short trips, especially mm -hmm. long trips. Uh, but now that the younger ones are getting older, it's easier to take everyone um, together. And so we try our best to, to balance this. Now, Trey, do your kids uh, follow your footstrip with a with a passion towards photography or a curiosity towards it? Um, no, uh, not, not specifically into photography. Um, we do encourage them artistically, of course. Um, mm -hmm. and But we don't really, you know, we're not like uh, these, uh, you know, Chinese tiger moms or whatever that stand behind <laughs> are always making sandwiches while they're on uh, on the piano learning, uh, you know, Bach at age five. So we're not like that, but we're uh, we do encourage them to try a lot of different things. My son is more into music. He's been uh, like, there's a cool new uh, app for the iPad called DJ Two or something where you can actually mix together and do all this stuff. So he's really into music. He plays the guitar. He plays the piano. My my daughters, um, like all kids, frankly, are just like into just creating art. They just make crazy stuff with glitter glue on construction paper, and they, they're happy about it. Glitter so, glue is uh, the best. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so, you know, we, we definitely encourage their artistic side, and we, we go off and we draw together. I like sketching and these sorts of things, so I sketch pads, and we all go off and start sketching things together as a family, and that's kind of fun. Um, so, uh, yeah, not uh, photography specifically, but I, I mostly encourage them to experiment and play with lots of new tools because I don't think that photography really is going to continue to evolve as much as it is going to splinter into like a thousand different shards as more and more tools become available to create the photos and to process and to share um, this whole idea of digital art is uh, just going to, to explode all over the place so rather than have them learn specifically what I do I'm much more into them experimenting by using a lot of different tools to create something that had never been created before so Trey, if you could go back in time and give the 21-year-old Trey some advice, what advice would you give yourself? Uh, well, I th this is a really weird thing to think about, isn't it? This idea that, oh my gosh, what if I was 21 again and I knew everything that I, I knew now? <laughs> um, wouldn't that be awesome? But I, th I think it's actually impossible to imagine that kind of a world or what I would even say to myself. Um, I, uh, I, but I do pretty much a good analog of this when I go around and have speaking engagements, especially when I talk to high schools or these sorts of things. I think, okay, oh, you know, I've got all these kids in here. Man, what would I, if I was to go visit myself, you know, ghost of Christmas past and, and tell myself these, these golden nuggets of truth. So um, one, one thing that I, I do recommend and I actually recommend this for all ages, but I think the sooner you learn this trick, the better. Uh, and this is especially good in high school or just beyond that. Is, you know, if you think back to high school and or college or whatever, uh, you're, you're so um, self-absorbed or self-consumed isn't the word, but more self-worried is the thing. So you walk into a room, right, whether it's your homeroom or a class or, uh, you're going to PE or anything, and you assume that everyone else in the room knows what's going on except for you, right? You go into a dance or you, you're you about to go run a, a 5K or something. So you walk up and you're like, oh my gosh, everyone knows what's going on here except for me. And you do your best just to kind of fit in, you know, uh, so that you don't look incompetent or clueless. You just kind of go with the flow. And then so as you're going around, you're, um, you know, you're, science class or English class or or just any social situation in the lunchroom you think oh my gosh you know so much of your brain cycles are caught up worrying about what other people are thinking about you you know and this is actually a a total waste of your your valuable brain cycles because now that we're all grown-ups or whatever we can look back to high school and we say wait a minute nobody knew what was going on all these kids were clueless they were all just feeling their way through. There was no one that truly grokked the situation. And then as you get older, you start to realize, wait, you know, what's to say that when, when you're a grown-up, it's any different? You know, so like you walk into, like, let's say you're at a conference or something. There's a bunch of photographers there. You walk in, maybe you're new, or maybe you've just been doing it a few years, and you think, oh, my gosh, everyone here knows exactly what's going on. Uh, they know... Uh, you know, they're all good photographers, they understand business, they're all making a lot of money, they're all successful. I don't really know what's going on. Well, don't think like that because everybody is struggling. Everybody is figuring this stuff out as we go through this together. So if you can just stop spending so many brain cycles thinking about what other people are thinking and just think about, you know, yourself and your own creative process and what you're going to do, um, then you're much more focused on, on your own success, your own self, on your own continual destructive creative process within yourself and you stop worrying about what other people are doing. Fantastic, fantastic answer. So on that note, what is the best business advice that you've been given? Well, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So my, my life is a, a weird one. My uh, uh, my path to here, because you know, I wasn't always a photographer. I, I didn't even, uh, you know, get a camera until I was uh, 35, and now I'm a tender 42. 
So, you know, up until then, um, I had done many different things, um, mm -hmm. various degrees of failure and success, mostly, mostly failure. But, I mean, I did everything from, my background is computer science and math, and immediately I went in to work for this company called Anderson Consulting, which is a big consulting firm like Deloitte or Pricewaterhouse or these sorts of places. And I did a lot of technology stuff, so we would go into businesses and kind of re-engineer their businesses using technology. So I had to get to learn how these businesses actually worked. Um, so that was super valuable. Um, and then I went on and entrepreneurially started several different companies and I had lots of clever people on my boards of directors that would give me all kinds of advice. And, um, and this one, um, I don't know, I don't know if I hesitate to give this, this piece of advice because I don't know if it actually works that well with photographers or if I'm just an anomaly. But I had one guy on my board of directors that uh, grabbed me and he said, Trey, he goes, he goes, you can't ever get, he, like to him, getting rich was everything, right? He defined himself by how much money he had, which you know, I don't think is the right way to define himself. But anyway, this is, this is the lens through which he saw the world. So he grabbed me, he goes, he goes, Trey, he goes, you can't ever get rich by charging by the pound, the mile, or the hour. And so... That uh, you know, that was actually very interesting to me, and I, I realized that there are a lot of uh, people out there that do charge by um, the uh, a physical quantity of what they actually uh, produce or able to do, like how many hours you have in a day. Like, so you're limited by how many hours you have in a day. If, it's at, if that's how you define your income, uh, you can still make a decent income, but you're still defined by how many arbitrary hours you happen to be awake. You know, there's only 24 hours in a day, and you've got family and other things. So, you know, maybe that's not the best way um, if, uh, and again, not that wealth is your goal in life or anything, but, you know, if you want to have enough or you don't have to worry about it, then, now there's a few exceptions to that. There's like really high paid, uh, you know, lawyers and doctors and stuff that do charge by the hour, by the patient, by the client. Uh, but even to get to that level, that sort of elite level, you have to start out as a, a you know, a junior or an associate or work your way up and it can take, you know, tens of years, you know, and maybe these are the best years of your life as you're getting up to that point, you know, maybe these are your age from 20 to 50, you spend it all getting up to this point where an hour of your time is maybe worth, you know, several hundred dollars or several thousand dollars, you know, maybe that point's worth it, but really maybe you've also given away uh, 20 years of your life to do it. So anyway, I mean, I don't want to make this a big old businessy conversation, but that was actually a very interesting thing that that guy told me. And uh, it did. It did end up affecting what has happened at, at Stuck in Customs. And and here you are today. So now, you know, Trey, you've you've really set yourself apart from a lot of photographers out there. And let's call things as it, as they are. We live in a world of carbon copies. What advice can you give to those seeking to be unique, and unlike others in a very congested photography industry? Well. My advice is always uh, counterintuitive, and I don't think anyone ever listens to me. That's okay. Uh, but this is <laughs> this is what I advise, or well, I don't know. That seems weird, a weird way to say it. But well, I would like be interested in stuff outside of photography, like things like anthropology and science and biology and economics and history and you know travel or whatever. And so I think if your influences if your ideas and inspiration come from outside the photography industry, it will end up making your photography more interesting and more unexpected. And I'm afraid that what happens with a lot of well-meaning photographers at various levels is, the, well, the thing about photographers, you know, as you guys know, uh, it tends to attract fairly uh, smart, intellectual um, people that really think deeply about things, probably think maybe too too deeply about things, which is fine, but what happens is that you once you get into photography, you realize, oh, there's a lot of other photographers out there that are also into photography, how how cool, and then you, you end up hanging out with them all the time, or you go to these conventions, or you uh, get these certain photography books, and I think what happens accidentally is that you end up becoming part of the group think, right, and so well-meaning people that especially when you're beginning, you're a sponge for information, you want to know as much as you can about photography. So you end up going to these photography conventions and then like they have like a session, this is just a totally random example, but you know, plug in whatever you want to. They have a session on 
color calibrating your monitor. You, and before that, you thought, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that I should color calibrate <laughs> my monitor. And then everybody is talking about color calibrating your monitor, and you go online and you see forums, and people are like talk, have these long posts about how to do it and why it's important. And, and then, then all of a sudden, you're like, oh my gosh, I really need to be thinking about color calibrating my monitor. And it becomes this major, you know, thing in your life. And then you learn about it, you become good at it. You're like, okay, now I know how to color calibrate my monitor. And then you jump into conversations of the future. You help get people interested in this idea of color calibrating your monitor when actually you can make a case that it doesn't even matter because 99% of the people that see your photos they don't have color calibrated monitors so why are you worried about it? so anyway <laughs> the, the point is is that when you go to these conventions or you get caught up in the group think whether it's color calibration or you name the subject whether it's technical or aesthetic you accidentally become part of the group think and your brain no matter how independent of an artist you are if you're constantly hearing certain kinds of things that repeat themselves, what happens is you accidentally begin thinking and doing stuff like everybody else. Sure. So th this is one reason I kind of like being far away, maybe in New Zealand, or, or actually, I've actually never been to a photography conference. Um, not because I'm, um, you know, elitist or any that nonsense. It's just, and maybe I just say this to myself, but. I am a little bit afraid of becoming a part of the group thing because I don't want my work to be um, derivative work. And I feel like, um, you know, of course I love photographers. I love hanging out with, with all of us from time to time. Uh, but my influences and thought processes mostly come from outside of the photography industry. Sure. Now, now you bring up uh, technology. Uh, do you feel technology is making better photographers? Um, well, I don't know if that there's maybe a, a, a technical problem with that question because the uh, the word photographer is becoming increasingly vague. Um, mm. So I don't know. I don't. Digital artist seems. How do you categorize these things that we do nowadays? So it's very difficult. But I do certainly believe that technology makes the creative process much more interesting than it has sure. been in the past. Now, people have always used technology to do things like the Impressionists were able to put paint inside metal tubes, which didn't exist, and then they were actually able to go out to a beach and uh, paint what the light and the beach and all this stuff actually looks like rather than just remembering it and going back to their city. So that, that technology enabled them to do something that was never there before. So now it's no longer in metal tubes, but these are tools that you can download to your to your computer, to your iPad or whatever. So these, there's so many tools available and I think that as a visual artist, let's say, that you can do a lot more to define your style um, with tools, with post-processing than you can with a camera because unless you're like, uh, have a super special kind of lens or a really unique style uh, that you like to do just capturing in camera, it's kind of hard to do something super unique nowadays just with a camera. I mean, yeah, maybe you could lay on the floor with a wide-angle lens and you could do all kinds of crazy stuff. Like, So you, you, can, you can get some sort of an aesthetic uh, just by where you happen to place your body and your the lens choice. But mm -hmm. I think, um, I really feel quite deeply that you can do much more um, interesting work in post-processing um, than you can when you actually happen to be holding a camera. Sure. Great answer. So now the trade next, you know, there there are a lot of folks in the industry. Or I'm sorry, in the, the world that are trying to reinvent themselves. You, yourself, you had a computer science major. Uh, assuming that you had your camera, you had your lens, uh, lighting gear if need be. If you had to start over and you only had five hundred dollars to get your business started, how would you go about setting up that business, or spending that five hundred dollars rather? Oh, uh, well, okay, uh, I'll give you a, a bifurcated answer. My first answer is always, well, I wouldn't even get in, I wouldn't even try to start this talk about <laughs> business. Uh, again, no one ever listens to me because they just want, there's, there's no, nothing that says, you know, you've got to make money doing what you love. I think mm -hmm. that you should do what you love, but it doesn't, that doesn't mean you should necessarily make money um, doing what you love, you know. Like, 
I can't find anyone to watch me. Or um, oh, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that joke. It's it's a little bit off call. <laughs> but um, you know, you can't. There's a lot of weird things in life that you love doing at, that you'll never figure out for a, a way to people to pay you to do it. Mm -hmm. So, um, but if you're going to ignore that advice, um, uh, because I find like, let me step on that a little bit more because people photographers are often very creative, interesting people that have multifaceted interest. Maybe, um, maybe you can find something else to do with your life to make money that is creative and then keep the photography pure. Because I, I, I do know a lot of, of you know really interesting photographers and it, it's a weight on them. Like, oh, I've got to take this thing I love and use it to make money. And I mm -hmm. think that there's this violent collision between money and art and passion and that just doesn't feel right sometimes. And I hate to see people's art suffer because they're so worried about the money aspect of it. So mm -hmm. if you if you do love photography and you're worried about selling it, I would just do something else to make money. Now, if you're going to ignore all that, you're like, oh, okay, I don't care. I, I just I'm gonna do I want to use photography to make money. I have five hundred dollars specifically to your question, what would I do? Well, I would not um, let's say you already have a camera because it's hard to get a decent camera for uh, $500. But mm -hmm. um, by the way, now I uh, I no longer use a DSLR myself. I I now use a like a Sony NEX7. That's sort of my main great camera, camera. NEX system. Yeah, and so you can actually get one of these cameras very inexpensively for about a thousand. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a camera and you have another $500, like you said. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I would just spend it all on post processing. Um, things like uh, Lightroom, you know, you can do a lot with just Lightroom, and that's pretty inexpensive. Um, you could probably get like a, a Photoshop Elements or one of these Nick software tools. Ever since Google bought Nick, it's much cheaper. You can do a sure. lot of stuff with that. Um, and so you can just start experimenting and finding styles that you like and combine them together. Uh, so uh, you know, I think you'll get a lot of uh, a lot of fun um, and a lot of interesting work out of that. And you might be able to put together a portfolio. With just five hundred dollars in post processing, that you can uh, that you can use. So I have I've on my site I have an HDR tutorial that's quite popular, and actually that's how a lot of people end up discovering my work. And in there I recommend some software in particular called uh, Photomatics, and a little discount code and that kind of stuff to to save you money. Uh, but Photomatics um, is a great tool. Um, almost all my tools, all, almost all my uh, photos have some kind of path through Photomatics, so uh, that's a that's a really good one. That's under a hundred dollars. Sure. Now the my next question is normally to ask you what are some resources that you use on a regular basis, and so I'm going to put that out there because I'm going to swing back around to because these kind of mesh into into one here. You know, you bring up Photomatics. What are some? And you brought up Lightroom. Yeah. What percentage of your, your workflow would you say is in Lightroom, Photoshop, Photomatix, uh, or if there's any other softwares that you use to create these, these pieces that you have? Yes, well, the, so I use uh, a lot of different things. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, when you first take the photo and you just grab that nice thick raw file, that's just sort of a sketch as a starting point. And so when I begin my my process, I'll describe it here uh, very, very briefly, but uh, I use a panoply of tools and I create many versions of the photo that I think are interesting. They're just mm -hmm. ideas. I sort of go through this idea generation phase. So I make a version in Lightroom that looks interesting. I'm like, oh, that looks interesting. And then, so I have these other presets and I click on a different preset. I go, oh, that looks nice. And then I've got these two. I'm like, oh, they're totally different, right? They're just different interpretations of that raw light file. Like, that looks nice, mm -hmm. that looks nice. And then I can't decide. You know, I feel very indecisive, like a woman. I'm in touch with my <laughs> feminine side. And so um, I'm like, oh, I like this one, but I also like this one. I can't really decide. And then I open up another tool. You know, I, I run it through Photomatics or through Nick Software, these various things. And I'm like, oh, I like this, and I like that. And then I end up... So I'm in this sort of idea generation phase for a while where I'm just creating many different versions of the photo. And I, I export all of them. This is all in this tutorial that we're giving away, by the way. So, <coughs> so I export all of them. Then I've got sort of these just ideas, you know, maybe five to ten ideas. And mm -hmm. then I bring them all into Photoshop and I layer them all on top of each other. 
And then I start choosing like, oh, well, I like this part of this photo and that part of that photo. And so it's a very um, individual thing. And this is sort of my, um, and I don't know if I'm a traditional teacher or not, because I do not ever say like step one, do this, step two, step, step two, do that, step three, do that. In fact, there's a lot of books out there that say, you know, you do these seven steps or there, so much of photography tutorials is step based. And I think that's another problem with the group thing because it indicates that there is a recipe to get something done. Um, and I am the antithesis of that. I'm much more free form because I think that what happens is if you follow this, this process, if you understand what I'm saying by having various ideas that you've generated and then you combine them together, then your photo and your style will be totally uniquely yours and it will be a product of your personality, the way you feel, and it's guaranteed that you're not going to have a photo that looks like anyone else's. It's kind of because you know now you can look at Instagram filters and go like, oh, I know what filter that was, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So this becomes something that's uniquely yourself. And let's say that you don't even know who uniquely you are yet in post processing. Well, by following this and rinsing and repeating, you'll come to find your personality and your artistic self just through this very process. Very cool. Very cool. That's uh, you become a curator of uh, ideas and pick the one that uh, that that uh, becomes the biggest bleep in your radar scope and call it a day. Yeah, that's right. The, Trey, what are some uh, some must have? So you're you're using a Sony NAX7 right now. What are some must have items in your camera bag? Well, so. Um, Man, it's actually been really nice. Uh, let me tell you something else. Since, since I've, I used to use a, uh, I've had everything from a Nikon D3X to a D800 and all this sort of stuff. And uh, also, by the way, Sony has not uh, paid me to switch or they don't give me, they offered to give me free cameras and free lenses for life, but I told them no because I wanted to keep it pure. I was going to ask what caused the, the, the switch over to, I mean, the NEX7 yeah. is, the whole line is a great, great camera. Uh, yeah. So you came from the, the Nikon side of it. Yeah. What was the what was the the cause of the shift there? Well, this is um, uh, this is actually a really big deal because I am uh, uh, you know I I love Nikon and I didn't have mm -hmm. a deal with Nikon either. I just kind of bought their stuff. And, uh, but um, you know, uh, thanks since the company is doing well, this sort of thing, we have you know whatever a ton of resources to buy whatever. I wanted to use the best. You know, life is short. Why? Why not use the best? And the, you know, the popular thought out there, again, part of the group think, is that you need a big DSLR in order to make a professional photo, right? This is what the group think is. And not that I just go against the group think for the sake of going against the group think, but I always do reanalyze my premises. And um, some people were talking about these mirrorless cameras, mm -hmm. and I thought, you know, this seems logical you know why do you have to have a mirror inside of a camera that flips up and down in order to take a good photo that seems like a very strange arbitrary mechanical process in order to take a good photo so I thought well maybe you don't need a mirror that bounces around inside in order to take a good photo so what kind of cameras are out there that don't have a big mirror that bounces around and of course as soon as you get around get around that the cameras get much much smaller sure so I thought well Maybe I can carry on a smaller camera uh, that has smaller lenses that can do the same thing. So I had a year when I had both cameras, the Nikon and the Sony. And um, I would experiment with the Sony. I thought, oh, this is pretty good. But then I'd have these go-to situations. Are like, okay, look, I'm here. I'm here in Queenstown. There's a great sunset happening over at the Remarkables. I'm going to go take a photo. And you know, this is always often kind of last minute. I'm like. I'm gonna grab my Nikon just because I know what I'm doing with that thing. It's it's a, it's a slam dunk. I, I know my lenses. I get my 14 to 24, and you know I just know the settings. I've got my auto bracketing down. I've got it all figured out. So mm -hmm. I would come out here and I would grab the Nikon. And I would go. Um, so I kept doing that for a year, even though I would experiment with the Sony and I kind of liked it, but I didn't really make the switch. So then I thought, wait a minute, this is crazy. Um, my my D800 broke a few times. Uh, probably my fault. Uh, but then I was kind of forced to use the NEX7. I go, oh, this isn't actually too bad. And then I would try it. Once I got my, my Nikon fixed, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do an experiment for a month. And even though I have my Nikon, I'm just not going to use it. So mm -hmm. I went to San Francisco and China and all these places. And I just took my, uh, I just used my, well, I took both just in case. But I only used my uh, Sony NEX7 the whole time. I thought, well, what can mm -hmm. I actually do? 
And so I came back with photos that are just amazing. I, I love them. I'm super happy with it. I don't think I could have done any better with the Nikon. So now I've, I've sidelined the Nikon. And sure. I actually don't bring it on trips at all anymore. I just take, uh, I have an NEX6 or an NEX7 and an NEX6. And I heard they might come out with another NEX in a few months. Um, so, yeah, I've totally made the switch. Um, it's been fantastic. You know, Love this. this this uh, NEX7 is uh, six times smaller than the D800, mm -hmm. which is already half the size of the D3X. So it's, I mean, can you imagine? So a camera, when you said camera bag, sorry, this sent me on this whole thing. I actually realized <laughs> that I don't really carry much of a camera bag anymore because, I, so I carry the camera, and then I take my two other lenses, I just put them in my pockets. You know, it's sure. this idea that you actually have to have a bag full of shit. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Um, you don't. You don't actually have to have this giant bag you carry around anymore because you know you're the important thing. Um, and then if you can get the lenses small enough or whatever, you just put them in your pockets. You're good to go. Yeah, I was about to say with a lot of the traveling that you're doing, seeing that you're no longer bringing the the obviously the full DSLR and obviously have uh, all the lenses that go with it, it's a lot less weight that you're having to uh, to go uh, bring it out there. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it really is a couple lenses, and uh, that's all I, I take. Now, I do take a camera bag with me, of course, because I've got my my extra camera, because you have to carry a backup camera, and then I've got some lens cloths and all that kind of nonsense. Uh, sure. But I kind of like leave that in the hotel room, and then when I go shoot, I just put a few lenses in my pockets. Well, convenient. So shifting gears a little bit, you know, folks are looking for duplicatable success out there. What would you say is your your uh, your all time favorite photography related book? Oh, um, I uh, I don't know. I I've never I've never read a photography book, so I I don't know. Um, I mean, I've kind of glanced through them, but I've never read one. So uh, okay. I don't know if I'd have good advice. I wrote one. Um, yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It seems so, to be that, that my own book is my favorite. Uh, but uh, yeah, that one did well. It actually it was sold out on Amazon in the U.S. and Canada and Australia and the U.K. Uh, but frankly, that book is a little bit dated. I don't even know if I'd recommend it because I I wrote it like three years ago or four years. It's all right, I guess. But well, we, I, we we do a lot of ebooks now on flatbooks.com, and so that's when I do writing, we kind of write our own ebooks and. Uh, so, I think your work's yeah. quite inspiring. So the you know, whether it's outdated or not, the you know, the art the the art form itself, I think, is just absolutely fantastic, and definitely you know recommend this to folks. Uh, a world in HDR. If you don't have it, look for some great inspiration. Definitely recommend Thanks. it. So I'll make a recommendation for you, Trey. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Trey, final question and. Something tells me you're going to dig this question because you know you like spaceships. Okay, so life has been found on another planet, and none other than Sir Richard Branson is piloting Virgin Galactica and has put together a team of engineers, doctors, uh, and scientists, and has asked you to come along to document the journey. Now the challenge is you can only bring one camera, two lenses, and two other items. What would you bring with you? Are we landing on the planet? Ooh, good question. Yeah, you know you're gonna be landing on the quest, <laughs> landing on the on the planet. Yeah. All right. That's yeah. That's a. So right now, in apps, I really wish there was a Sony NEX full frame camera that may, you know, by the time most people actually watch this, uh, you know, the videos have long tails. Maybe there is, one. <laughs> uh, but since there isn't one, um, I'd probably take my Sony NEX seven. Um, I take my uh, 10 to 18 millimeter lens, which I love. So, you know, it's an APS-C sensor, so it's got a crop factor of 1.5, which means it's effectively a 15 to 27 millimeter lens, which is good enough. I'd probably I'd take my, you know, my tripod, uh, because, you know, I figure even a low gravity situation wouldn't hurt to have a stable shot. Sure. And then the other lens I'd probably take is, I think it's the 55 to 210 millimeter um, e system lens that one's sure. pretty good um, and again with 
five crop factor that comes out to 87.5 to 315 millimeters. So you get good zoom out of that thing. And uh, yeah, those are the two lenses I would take. Um, you know, I'd like to take more lenses in case there's cool little, you know, lichens or creatures that do a little, <laughs> you know, shallow depth of field work with uh, with something like that. Uh, you know, I do like all those kind of photos too. I don't publish a lot of them, but I, I have a good, uh, I have another, this good Zeiss, this 1.8, or maybe it's a 1.4 e-mount lens. It's a good one. Um, sure. But yeah, I could, it's just those two. I would just kind of stick to my landscape roots and uh, go with those two lenses. Just, just go wide. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, now, Trey, before we go signing off, uh, can you share with the listeners where they can find you, and then we can say goodbye? Um, sure, yes. Well, uh, I'm a lot of places, but I guess my favorite place is my blog. Um, stuckincustoms.com. Um, every day I put up a new photo and I, I write a little bit about it. Uh, so that's really my home base. But I end up doing a lot of stuff on Google Plus, especially. Um, we, uh, you know, we make a lot of, put up a lot of videos or do fun interactive things. Uh, and uh, Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest uh, to a lesser degree, but still out there. And also, sure. by the way, whenever you see stuff, it's always uh, it's always me that's actually typing. I don't have members of my team pretend to be me and do social media. It's always actually me. So, and I, the bad thing is that I don't get to respond to everybody because uh, there's just too much incoming. But you do know that if you get a response, it's actually me that's doing it. It's not someone pretending to be me. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, all of you uh, photography talkers, you can also find links and details about Trey on photographytalk.com forward slash Trey Ratcliffe. That's R-A-T-C-L-I-F-F. And incidentally, going back, uh, so we're going to put a time on this great offer that Trey has offered to us. So, folks, if you want to take advantage of that, simply make a comment on the Facebook, I'm sorry, on the Photography Talk Facebook page in this post talking about this interview. Make any sort of post about uh, Trey. We love Trey. Great uh, interview, this and that. Tomorrow, 3 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, we're going to pick one of you, and uh, you'll win a fantastic gift thanks to Trey there. So, Trey, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule today. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next time.